Good morning. This is the new day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, second Sunday of Easter, welcome. It's hard to believe uh, that we've been through the major uh, weekend of the Resurrection Sunday, uh, and we now have moved into the season of Easter. And for the first time in my ministerial career, uh, I'm actually getting a better understanding of what this season of Easter looks like. It's the 50 days between Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost Sunday, and it's known as the season of Easter. Well, normally growing up uh, the way I did in my Protestant uh, background and uh, my ministerial career has been that Sunday, Easter Sunday itself, uh, April 12th, was the significant day, and then you tried to recuperate post then because it was such a big day. And from that point on, actually, this Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, was considered down Sunday because people didn't show up as much as they had the Sunday before. Well, this year, for the first time in my ministerial career, uh, this Sunday will be looking like last Sunday. I've still got my two parishioners uh, here that are here observing me as I'm taping these uh, sermons. Uh, and so the same as it was for Easter Sunday. So for me, this is a change. It's a pretty dramatic change that no longer is Easter just a one day event. It's actually 50 days, 50 days of a, a time of rebirth, of a time of, of uh, living into the resurrection and the significance that the resurrection is. Uh, if you're not familiar with the history of Easter, the reality is it, most scholars would say that uh, Historia, who was the goddess of fertility, goddess of the spring among the pagans in Germany and the Anglo-Saxons, uh, when Christians came to the scene to convert pagans, uh, they took on that holiday experience and said, let us tell you the good news. Let us tell you what true uh, new life means, what true rebirth means uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's where we have the Easter dynamic has come from and why it appears on the calendar the way it does. And so we're going to, uh, during the next seven weeks, uh, that we have Sundays uh, in Easter. We'll be actually looking at this kind of continued conversation about Easter and what difference it really does make based from the story uh, of the resurrection and post the resurrection all the way up to Pentecost, which is actually May 31st. It is interesting how the COVID-19 virus seems to have really uh, put in a block of time for us. They're now talking about June 1st being a uh, possible opening up uh, of uh, society away from the sheltering at home. Uh, so it gives us that opportunity to truly celebrate the full season of Easter all 50 days uh, at home, reflecting, uh, understanding the true significance of it. Uh, and so in some ways, this will be like Lent. I've always had the 40 days of Lent, uh, getting prepared for Easter and have always kind of honored that and cherished that. Well, now we've got a 50-day block uh, of the Easter season. So it should be an interesting dynamic for me personally, for me as a, as a minister, and for us as a church and for all of you others that are uh, seeing this uh, service as well. Uh, it can be a shift of change, and hopefully it will be a time of rebirth, a time of uh, new life and new dynamics happening, and hopefully we will all uh, live into the resurrection uh, the way we should. Last Sunday, April the 12th, uh, I had the opportunity, as I hope you did, uh, to see the uh, uh, Andrea Bocelli concert that was uh, done on YouTube coming out of Milan, uh, uh, sponsored by both the city of Milan and the Duomo of Milan. Uh, and I hope you had the chance to see it. The overall concert, all 30 minutes, were wonderful. The songs in Latin uh, and beautiful classic, uh, classic hymns of the church. Uh, I will say for me personally, it was that closing that they did uh, with Amazing Grace as uh, they came out in front of the Duomo of, of Milan and they kind of expanded, they pulled back and sh showed the full cathedral in its uh, grandeur uh, as uh, Bocelli was singing Amazing Grace in English. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to capture that moment because it truly was a gift, a gift to me and a gift, I think, to the world that we were able to experience that on YouTube. Uh, and that was something that normal Easters uh, didn't have. And then it showed the, the um, it showed the empty, uh, vacant streets of Paris and of London and of New York. 
just kind of the stark reality we're living in at the moment. Uh, and the backdrop of those two really created a divine moment, a very powerful religious uh, experience. So if you've not had the chance, I encourage you to go on YouTube, uh, find the concert, uh, and I, I hope that you will enjoy it if you haven't already. Uh, it truly was an Easter gift, and so I hope that you will take advantage of it. Well, today, our scripture text as we continue in the lectionary readings that the Worldwide Church uh, embraces, we're now in the 20th chapter of John, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And these are kind of the post-resurrection appearances that uh, Jesus had. And this is the one that most people would uh, uh, connect with doubting time. Thomas uh, would be uh, part of how most people identify this particular scripture passage. Uh, but from, I'll be reading from the New International Version. Hear these words. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, when the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with this, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus' disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with him this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing, by, but by believing you may have life in his name. All of us have scars. And, and I would say that everyone at some time has taken great delight in telling others how they got a particular scar. I once uh, observed a minister who, who actually made a mistake in a kid's sermon asking them if they had any scars. And the talk was hijacked by the kids as they gave graphic, graphic details on how they got certain scars and they delighted in showing them to everyone else. Sometimes when visiting folks in the hospital, it's not unusual for a patient to want to show you a scar. And sometimes it's just a little bit too much information as the covers are rolled back and the story is related about the scar. Often a scar is there for a lifetime. It's a reminder of what happened the day that we received that injury, when, when we received that pain, when we received that blood, the, the visit to the doctor, or even the stitches. A scar can remind us of an operation, of an injury, of our foolishness that caused it. Some of us have scars that aren't visible on the outside. We have been scarred in our hearts, and, and these scars remind us of certain hurts and, there, and uh, times in our lives that we would prefer, you and I would prefer to forget. They're even more hurtful than those on the outside of the body. The story is told of a little boy whose mother led him out of the car under a big tree and then told him he, she would return, but she never did. 
This man, who's now middle-aged, one day a friend was to meet him for lunch. And this friend arrived 15 minutes late, and he found his friend in such a state of high agitation, pacing about, perspiring heavily, visibly upset, and it seemed a little bit overreaction since his friend was only 15 minutes late. Later, he said to his friend, I know why I get so bent out of shape when someone's late, but, but I just can't help it. My mother kept me waiting under a tree all afternoon, and she never, never, ever returned. I, I just can't stand it when someone I care for is late. He was no longer a kid, but, but, but the scars that he received early in life, they had affected him badly. And I'm sure that all of us recognize certain inner scars that even we, we all carry. I quote from a book, John Powell, Why I'm Afraid to Love. We are much largely shaped by others who in an almost frightening way hold our destiny in, our lo in, their, in their hands. We are each of us the product of those who have loved us or refused to love us. Oh, we hear stories. We, we hear stories ever so often of people who've been treated, treated and have treated children badly in their early years and how, how this has scarred them, scarred them for life. Most psychological scars are acquired actually in the first seven years of life. And the point is, is that to be human, to be human for any of us, is to have scars. And scars are the result of a sin in one way or another. In today's Gospel reading, the risen Christ, he appears in a room, a room that is locked tight and it shows himself to these despondent disciples. He spoke to them, and as often, so often before, he says, peace. But they don't recognize this is really Jesus. In fact, Luke actually reports in a different gospel that when the disciples first see Jesus, they were terrified. They were absolutely terrified, uh, thinking that they were actually seeing a ghost. Luke goes on and says, Jesus says, why are you so alarmed? Why are these doubts coming in your minds? Look at my hands, look at my feet, and see that it is I myself. Feel me and you will know, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Luke describes Jesus eating with the disciples, something not done by ghosts. There can be no doubt about it. Jesus is standing there in the room in the flesh. He's a genuine human being. They saw, they touched, they believed. Jesus says the same thing in our gospel reading today. He showed them his hands and his side. He showed them his scars. And then only then, when they saw, they rejoiced. Now, Thomas shows up a little later. He wasn't with the other disciples there for that Easter appearance. The other disciples tell him of the risen Christ, but, but Thomas says, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Perhaps we shouldn't be too hard on Thomas. He isn't just being obstinate. I mean, he's going through the same concerns as the other disciples had. In effect, he's saying, I can't believe that it's Jesus unless I touch his scars because the Jesus I know was nailed on the cross and his wounds are in his hands and his feet. Thomas is finding it hard to believe. Hard to believe the report of his friends that said they had seen Jesus, the same Jesus who he knew had died. A week later, the risen Christ again surprises his disciples. Thomas is there this time, and Jesus obliges. Put your finger in here and see my hands, and reach out your hands and put them into my side. 
The risen Christ says, stop doubting and believe. Thomas and the other, other disciples believe when they see Jesus' scars. It, it seems that the gospel writers are deliberately making a connection between the belief in the risen Christ and the scars of Christ. You see, the risen Christ could have erased the scars that he had received from the nails and the spears, not to mention the scars from the terrible whips that had tortured his body. In fact, you and I, we would expect the risen Christ would have had the perfect body with no scars. But the risen Christ has scars. The person appearing before them is the very same Jesus they loved who died on the cross. The scars on his body make it quite clear who this person is. It is by these scars that Jesus was recognized and the disciples were overjoyed. Oh, there's a story in the Odyssey. I don't know if you had to read the Odyssey as a child. I did. I'm assuming most of you did as well. But there's a story about Odysseus near the end of the book of the Odyssey, which was written back by Homer in 8th century B.C. Where the part of the story is where um, Odysseus finally returns home after being away for a very, very long time. He has heard that there were certain men who, who were very fond of his wife, and Odysseus wanted to find out how faithful she had been to her husband. So he disguises himself. He disguises himself as, as an old beggar, and, and nobody recognizes him at home, not even his wife and son. That night, just before bed, the elderly nurse who actually had cared for Odysseus as a child, she bathes him. And she thinks he's just, uh, uh, she's merely just bathing an old beggar, stranger, who's visiting for the night. But while bathing him, she recognizes a scar on Odysseus' leg. The same scar she remembered from his infancy. She didn't recognize him until she saw the scar. Jesus tells us to look at his hands and his feet. Reach out and put your hand in his side to see his scars and to believe and to be filled with joy. Early in the history of the Christian church, there were those who claimed that Jesus didn't really suffer on the cross. That Jesus didn't really live as we must live on this earth. It only appeared, Jesus only appeared to suffer. He only appeared uh, to be human. It was unthinkable that the Son of God could have lowered himself to such a degree. No, the church said, Jesus was God and Jesus was fully human. The divine risen Christ bore human scars. Only a wounded God can save. The first letter of Peter goes so far as to say, by his wounds you have been healed. Scars are a part of life, of our life as humans. Jesus received scars because Jesus was truly human. Even after the resurrection, we must still say that he's truly human. As we heard from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was keen on demonstrating to his disciples that he wasn't a ghost, he wasn't an invention of their imagination. He told them to look at his hands, look at his feet, feel me and you will know, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. You might add, a ghost doesn't have holes in my hands or feet where I was pierced by nails. As you can see, as Jesus said, I have. Christ was truly human, even after the resurrection. Jesus makes a point of showing his scars both to the disciples in Easter day and a week later in the presence of Thomas. The risen Christ wants to show that the resurrection doesn't make the cross meaningless. 
there is an interconnectedness between the cross and the empty tomb. There are some Christians who only want to know the glorified and risen Jesus. Oh, they know he died on a cross, but that isn't relevant because now he is alive again. Their image of Christ is a Christ in glory with raised arms and blessing over the church and over the world. The scars are there, but, but they're hardly noticeable on a king with a golden crown and with royal robes. The post-resurrection experiences highlight that the resurrected Christ is the one who died for us. He wants us to always keep in before us that even though he has been raised from the dead, the fact remains that he suffered and died, receiving horrible scars because of our sin. That is why churches have crucifixes on their altars. As we look at the figure of Christ with nails through his hands and feet, we are reminded of the wounds that he suffers for us, for our sinfulness. His scars remind us of the forgiveness won for us on the cross. And as we gaze at the wounds of the resurrected Christ, we realize that here we have someone who knows what it means to suffer. Here is a person who has not removed himself into the high and mighty places of heaven and no longer feels for those who are hurting. That's very important to remember during this moment of COVID-19 when many people are suffering, maybe even you are suffering during this particular time. Christ understands your suffering. He is our Savior, our Savior who hurts when we are hurting, our Savior who agonizes with us in our pain, a Savior who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. As we suffer scars of pain, as we suffer hurt in our lives, we know that we have a Savior who knows what it is like to bear the scars of suffering. The scars on the body of the resurrected Christ tell us that even though we share in the new life in Christ, our scars are still with us. When a young woman became a Christian, she, was, she told, if, if you're a Christian, a real Christian, you'll always feel joy and peace in your heart. Jesus heals us of all of our sicknesses and overcomes all of our hurts. But she felt a great sadness, even after becoming a Christian, for she had been abused as a child. Yes, her Christian faith brought her much joy, but she still carried the scars and so did the risen Christ Jesus who had conquered death still bore the scars of his suffering and I would suppose that when Jesus ascended to heaven he still carried those marks of the nails with him we carry scars physical emotional and even spiritual the way that we carry those scars and we bear them in our lives will show to others the faith that we have and will witness to others of the resurrected Lord is very, very real to us. Jesus' scars bore witness to the fact that he had been crucified on a cross and that he was alive and very real to his disciples. And likewise, our scars are here to bear witness to the power of Jesus in our lives. So as we celebrate Jesus' glorious resurrection from the dead, today on this second Sunday of Easter, we are reminded to look at his hands and his feet. May we also gaze on those scars and be overjoyed that Christ suffered those wounds for us and rose again as the victor over sin and death. He has shown us his scars that we, you and I, might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing we may have life in his name. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen.
I invite you to join me in prayer as we lift up with the Lord's Prayer and the prayer of St. Francis as we close this service. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so from the prayer of St. Francis, we close with this. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I so much, uh, will not so much be consoled as to be consoled. To be understood as to, be under, to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It's in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us on this on the second Sunday of Easter. God bless you and keeping you safe.
came down from heaven and I danced on the earth in Bethlehem. I had my birth. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance. When the world turned black, you know it's hard to dance with the devil on your back. And they buried my body and they thought that I'd gone, but I am the dance and I still lived on. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you on. Wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance of he. They cut me down, and I rose up high, for I am the dance, and I'm never going to die. And I live in you, if you live in me. Yes, I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Thank you.